this stagnant breath of change by Brian Hodge, performed by Kristen Holland. Beasley had died three times within the last month alone. Each time they'd brought him back, and each time it got harder. The first was a simple heart attack, which they'd fought off by jump-starting him with a defibrillator, later balloon angioplasty. That opened the door to human error. Beasley's vitals were normal, until without warning... He flatlined. They'd traced that to a bag of potassium solution with too high a concentration and got his pulse going again by shooting him up with insulin and glucose, along with intravenous calcium and inhalations of albuterol. This last scare was the worst. A line infection that would have started small, as they always did then swamped him with tidal waves of bacteria before anyone realized what was happening. That was the insidious thing about line infections. Once one line was compromised, it was all but guaranteed to spread to the rest. And he was hooked up to so many. They got him through the worst of it, and once it looked as if Donald Beasley would survive another day, they stood down. By now, his room here at Good Sam was an ICU unto itself. And by now, the routine was familiar enough that Bethany knew what to expect once it was over. Hello, adrenaline crash, my old friend. Hello, relief. You seductive lie. As she always did once the crisis was averted, the inevitable pushed back a little farther. She retreated to the hall in her green scrubs to shake out the stress and peer out the nearest window to search the sky for signs. Retreating storm clouds, maybe, or a fading giant wisp of faces from years of bad dreams. There was no rational reason it had to be the sky, only that it seemed as good a source as any to unleash. Well, whatever was going to happen the day they couldn't bring him back. How long can we keep this up? Bethany asked the attending physician, who was prone to de-stressing in his own way. Cavendish, his name, but most here just called him Dr. Richard. He puffed at a cigarette as if it were the only thing keeping him upright. He was one of those doctors who continued to smoke in spite of knowing every reason not to. It would never catch up with him. That was the problem. His. Hers. And everyone else's. How much more can that withered old body of his take? As much as we can force on it, Dr. Richard said. I'll crack his chest open and crawl in there and stay if I have to. Heroics aside, she said. Just be honest. He'd been on staff here long enough to have treated her the summer she was eight, after she and her bicycle lost a minor altercation with a car. Today, he looked every year of it. If we're having this same conversation a month from now, I'll consider that a miracle. Richard chained another cig off the first. <sighs> Honest enough for you. A few hours later, when her shift was over, she dropped by Donald Beasley's room to reassure herself that she could leave with a clear conscience. Another post-crisis habit, like driving past a leaky dam to make sure the cracks hadn't widened. One of the off-duty nurses was sitting in a chair by the bed, watching him. Somebody was always watching him. The cycles of death and restoration had taken their toll. According to Beasley's charts, he was 76 now, but he looked at least a hundred. He was still unconscious, but would come around again, eventually, and she didn't want to be here when that happened. She'd done her time. Beasley might talk jabbering nonsense. Then again, he might be cognizant of everything and resume begging for them to let him die. Either option was its own brand of unnervingly awful. He would tug at the restraints holding his wrists to the bed rails, feeling
feeble and mewling, and somehow his desiccated body would find enough moisture for tears. They lived in fear of him, thinking to bite through his tongue in an effort to drown in his own blood. The watch nurse glanced back over one heavy, rounded shoulder and nodded a dead-eyed hello. They'd gone to high school together, sort of. Janet Swain had been a senior when Bethany had come in as an undersized freshman, no boobs to speak of, and invisible. They'd all gone to high school together here in Tanner Falls. If we can't save him, and we know it, say he's got a little time left, just not long. What would you want to do? Janet said. Would you give him what he deserves? Bethany squeezed her eyes closed. Don't ask me something like that. I would. I mean, why not? Last chance, why waste the opportunity? It's only what everybody in the whole town has wanted to do to him for years. If we announced it, there'd be a line ten thousand people long. We should raffle off chances while we still can. Is that really what you'd want to be thinking of at the end? I'd start with his eyes. Somebody going for your eyes, that's some scary business right there. I'd leave him one, though, so he could see what i do to the rest of him. Talk. Bethany tried to dismiss it as empty talk, no risk. They all needed to vent sometimes. Even old men are still attached to their ding-dongs. Janet smacked her hand on the bed rail and addressed Beasley directly. You think that catheter was painful going in, you old buzzard? You have no idea. If they got it out of their systems this way, maybe it would be enough, and they wouldn't lose control over the urge to act. And yeah, that is what I'll be thinking of at the end. Janet said this with a glare, almost an accusation. That's the kind of thing you get to think of when you don't have anybody. And no, you never will. She made companionship sound like a comfort she was denied. But really, was it? Maybe Janet was the lucky one here, and would see it that way when the time came. When not dying alone meant having to watch someone you love die next to you. Who really wanted that? They could all die alone, together. Bethany walked home after a shift, because she could. All the first stringers on the Beasley team lived close enough for a shoe-leather commute. Call it hospital policy and plain old good sense. They wanted to be able to assemble the top-tier crash team in minutes, any time of day or night, regardless of how much rain or snow or wind or ice might get in the way. The plan had gone into effect years ago, before the old man's health started to decline. It had begun early, as soon as the first of the city fathers from a generation ago died. They would all be sick old men one day. Some of them were already old. Others were already sick middle-aged men. Over time, they'd all done what sick old men do, eventually overcoming each and every extraordinary measure to prolong their selfish lives, until Donald Beasley was the last man standing, however unsteadily. Children used to sing about him years ago, and maybe still would, if only there were enough kids around to pass the song down to, the way these things used to work. But after a generation, birth rates had fallen so low by choice that children were now a rarity in Tanner Falls. Even they knew something was wrong in this place where their future had been taken from them before they were born. Old Mad Donald had a town, E-I-E-I-O, and in that town he had a goat, E-I-E-I-O. Horrible little song. You had to marvel at how jubilantly children could sing of terrible things without appreciating what they were actually about. Yet, she still missed the sound of it. There was a time when Tanner Falls had been a great place to grow up. That's how she'd experienced it. You could roam all day here, under the radar of adults, 
Even within town there were pockets of woodland that felt so much farther from civilization than they really were. Centuries of trees grown up around ponds and laced together by streams and paths worn smooth by bicycle tires. There were fish to catch and frogs to race. There were railroad tracks to explore, wondering where they led, hunting for treasures that might have fallen from passing trains. And if you couldn't find anything, at least there were plenty of targets daring you to throw rocks at them. And in the city park, the concrete band shell always seemed to smell faintly of pee, a phenomenon explained by the shards of brown glass that always seemed to reappear. But it projected your voice in a most wonderful way, especially when you bunched together with your friends to see how loudly all of you could shriek together, so that even the old people who lived by the park came out on their porches to scowl. And when you grew old enough for four wheels instead of two, you had the drive-in theatre on the edge of town, and the A&W where car hops on skates brought trays to hang on your door, loaded with burgers and onion rings and frosted mugs of root beer. And that was good for a while as well, until it all started to seem too small, and boredom became an enemy that could only be outrun by going anywhere else but here. Bethany didn't have to work to remember the town that way, because it was still the same. It was all exactly the same, as immutably fixed as the old spoke-wheeled cannon on the courthouse lawn, commemorating a war no one alive had even fought in. Like the shop on the corner over there, Stuart Drug and Sundries. Sundries? Who even used the word any more? Here they did. Across the street and down the block? Where would you even expect to find something called Franklin's Dime Store today, in this the post-Reagan years of George Bush? But here it was, unchanged from the pictures she'd seen when her parents were children. In any direction you looked where houses stood, you would see a skyline bristling with towering TV aerials, as if no one had ever heard of cable. They had... But it had never come here. Bethany knew enough of the world beyond to realize you were meant to remember such things fondly because they were no longer around. That was how nostalgia was supposed to work, mourning defunct businesses and outmoded ways and untamed land lost to bulldozers sent by developers who called it progress. Recalling them with a golden luster because they had meant enough to your heart once to crowd out memories of all the uglier things. Better off forgotten. Like that sign painted on the huge brick side of the Tanner Hotel, smack in the heart of downtown. Nigger, don't let the sun set on you here. Nobody wanted it. Nobody liked what it had to say, or what it said now about the town. They could scarcely bring themselves to look at it. It repelled the eye, yet resisted all efforts to erase its existence. Whitewash it, paint over it, paper over it, hang a banner across it from the roof. Whatever went up wouldn't last the night. Sandblasting just made a gritty mess. Even attempts at demolition were plagued by mechanical failure. It had been more than fifteen years since they'd given up trying, and Tanner Falls stayed just as it was in 1969. The hotel's insistence on cleaving to the status quo was one of the first bits of evidence that something was wrong here. Early proof that someone had done a terrible thing to them all. People change, people grow, those who can't die off, and with luck their worst notions die with them. Nobody wanted that hateful sign, anything other than gone. Except maybe for Donald Beasley, and the fellow town fathers from a generation ago who had beat him to the grave. There was a time when Tanner Falls had seemed like a great place to grow up. What an unlikely thing to have doomed it.
Matt was already home when she got there, his back support belt hanging from its peg by the side door. His shift had an hour to go yet, and by the look of things, he'd been home long enough for three cans of Iron City already. Matt was the first person she was aware of who'd figured out that once you had a job in Tanner Falls, it was impossible to lose it. A fact of life he exploited with heedless impunity. Termination was change, and hey, they couldn't have that. So there he was, still moving the same furniture in the same warehouse that had paid him for 15 hours a week after school in 1969, so he could save up to buy his first real guitar. He didn't notice her, such was his focus, so for a while she watched him play, watched him go somewhere else, the only way left to him. He was a lefty, and so was his Les Paul. Even Bethany, who had assisted while surgeons' hands worked wonders, could never figure out how Matt could be so dexterous as to play three parts at once. Rhythms on the bottom two strings, melodies on the top two, and harmony and counterpoint in the middle. The effects pedals between the guitar and amp made it even more expansive. A swirling, psychedelic storm front of thunder and squalls that climbed and plunged, that promised hope and delivered heartache. Every generation in every town had its Matt Meadows, the guy who could have really done something, gone places, if only he'd left. He noticed her finally and brought the spaceship in for a landing, the last ripple of arpeggios echoing into the sonic horizon until the only sound left in the hush of the house was the hum of his amp. And in every town, every girl had her own potential Matt. The guy she ended up marrying. Because she hadn't left either. That good a day, huh? He said. Later they went for a walk, meandering through the neighborhood. Then straying west, as she sensed he might. Through neighborhoods where the houses got bigger and farther apart. He had a homing instinct and Bethany knew where they were going to end up long before they did. A pocket of undeveloped woodland tucked alongside a tributary upstream of the falls that gave the town its name. Matt had a need to torture himself with this place, and all it had taken from them. She regarded this the way she regarded the beer he brought with him, even on a stroll. Didn't like it, but didn't object. Let Matt be Matt. Let him have what he needs to get by. Because without it, it could be so much worse. Everything would be worse soon enough. The trees were not packed tightly here, except for a few small compact groves. It was mostly an open field, with thickets enclosing the sides like walls, and a stream ran through it. Matt and his friends used to put on safety goggles and thick sweatshirts and have BB gun fights here. Nobody had ever lost an eye, a tooth. Welts were as bad as it got. No wonder they'd gotten the idea. They were blessed. They were boys, and for a time, invincible. In some other life, in some other town, she might have had a son just like that. She would have welcomed the prospect of fretting over every little injury and wound that, in the puzzling way of boys, grounded him with pride and meaning. She would have welcomed a daughter like this just the same. Only once had the orthonovum failed. She'd kept the procedure quiet. Kept Matt in the dark altogether. Nothing good could have come of him knowing. It wasn't that he would have disagreed with her decision, More that she didn't want to give him one more thing to regret. The hoof prints. Once here, Matt always went for the hoof prints. It was what people called them anyway. A row of inches deep depression striding along the broadest clearing in the field. They hadn't filled in during the 22 years they'd been here. 
as if something about their creation had seared them in place for all time. Life shunned them. Not even the most opportunistic weeds grew in them, or anywhere close. Honestly, Bethany didn't know if they were hoof prints or not. They were the right shape, cloven, like mirrored images of half-moons. Then again, each one was as big around as a truck tire. She'd been a child when the event had happened, not yet ten, and although she hadn't witnessed it, she'd heard so many stories that it felt as if she had. Not that the stories were necessarily trustworthy. People were liars, even if they didn't mean to be. By now the strands of folklore had wound so inextricably around fact that it was impossible to twist them apart and get to the truth of things. Under the black watch of a springtime new moon, the town had been lit for an instant by a flash of light. It wasn't lightning, though. No account ever mentioned a storm. It was more like reports describing the bright death of a meteorite. Nor was it white. Blue, some said. Others insisted it was green. While still others couldn't pin down a color at all. Only that they didn't find it. Natural. A fearsome wind had kicked up, too, and that lasted longer. Residents in the north of town swore it blew south, while those in the south swore it blew north. On the east side, they said it swept in toward the west, and here on the west side, the direction depended on how far out people were. They couldn't all be right, unless something had punched a hole in the night, like knocking out a window in an airliner that sucked the air in from everywhere at once. Maybe it had. People said that something appeared through the trees that night, big enough to have appeared above even the tallest ones. Some reported a churning cloud, while others swore they witnessed vast legs striding through the woods, coarse with bristling black hair and cloven hooves. A cloud with legs? Oh, why not? Something had changed the fundamentals of reality here. She couldn't recall the first time she'd heard someone in a low voice speak of the black goat of the woods with a thousand young. It was just one of those things you grow up with, like Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy. You think it'll come back right here? Matt said. Is that the way it's supposed to happen? I don't know, she said. Beasley, any of them, they've never said anything about what to expect? Not even at the end or when they were doped out on the good meds? No. He looked at her in a way that made it feel like they were strangers. He was just thirty-two, and already his face was too lined. You'd tell me, wouldn't you? You wouldn't keep it to yourself just to spare me. Briefly, she wondered if he knew about the abortion after all. How she'd suctioned out the life they'd created rather than see it born into a short, cruel existence as chattel. Most of those guys, she said, I think they're in denial about what they did. They wouldn't admit they'd done anything at all, much less speculate about what the consequences were going to be like. Not to us, anyway. Why would they? They knew by the time it happened they weren't going to be around to worry about it. Yeah, but... They had kids, grandkids. Denial can cover a lot of ground when you're determined. They walked, and he drank, and they pondered issues whose understanding would forever be denied them. How does something like that even get started in a town like this? Matt said. I bet they didn't even mean it. I don't know about that. Whatever happened here, it didn't happen because they were half-assed about it. At first, I mean, when they first started. I'll bet it was like some small-town, good old boy version of the Hellfire Clubs. Hellfire Clubs? This was a new one. That sounds ominous enough to me. Yeah, it wasn't. They were just something a bunch of upper-cross English and Irish politicians and other outwardly pious types did for a lark. An excuse for them to get together to frolic with whores and feel like bad boys. Matt looked at her. 
and couldn't have missed her puzzled expression. How this was in his storehouse of knowledge. I used to read up on stuff like that. When I was a kid, once I got to a certain point, all my favorite bands and musicians, they seemed like there was something dangerous about them. You'd hear how they were into things, secret things. It seemed like maybe they knew stuff nobody else did. It seemed like it should be true. How else could they be so good at what they did? But eventually you realize it's just an image. That must have been disappointing, she said. I don't know what was worse. Deciding it's all bullshit. Or realizing there's something to it after all. And these goobers here were the ones who figured it out. Beasley remained stable over the days to come. But word of his condition had spread. There was no way of keeping a thing like that quiet. Everyone in Tanner Falls had a vested interest in his health. And its insistence on declining set off a fresh wave of subdued panic. One would think they'd gotten it out of their systems years ago, but no. At the sound of a daybreak ruckus on her day off, Bethany looked out to see the Hendersons across the street and three houses down, stuffing their sedan with as much as it could hold. Middle-aged husband, middle-aged wife, twenty-something son still living with them because job prospects were dim. They loaded and argued, squabbled and hurried, and then, in a streak of taillights, they were gone. As if nobody had ever thought of this before. If it was happening on their block, she assumed that fear had pushed others across town into trying it too. Hopes bolstered by the mantra of the desperate, maybe this time will be different. Yeah, good luck with that. Nearly everyone able-bodied enough to do it had attempted at least once over the last two decades to get away. Failed efforts all. The early unsuspecting ones were those who simply had normal, greener pastures reasons to move along. The later refugees fled in terror, compelled by the very inability of others to leave. And the rumors that had started to spread about why the town shrugged off every attempt at modernity and change. They tried everything from moving vans to impulse exits with little more than the clothes on their backs. They'd driven cars, taken buses, ridden motorcycles. The more adventurous ones had attempted it on foot, as if to steal away with no more noise than what their shoes made would let them pass beneath the notice of what waited and watched, ready to corral them like straying livestock. Everyone, it seemed, had to prove it for themselves and often more than once. They would be back. The Hendersons would be back. While Matt slept, she made coffee and set up watch from the porch that night. All cool air and the creaking of crickets. How more normal a night could anyone ask for, except for the first aid kit by her chair? Just in case... The moon had arced halfway across the sky before things started to happen, when the street lights flickered and dimmed. However these entities moved, it seemed to create electromagnetic disturbances. It seemed more than a simple factor of visibility. Dimensions, some speculated. They moved in and out of different dimensions. Bethany had no recollection of the experience herself. One moment, they weren't there. And the next, they were. Like full-grown trees sprouted on the Henderson's lawn. But trees didn't scuttle from one place to another, or wield their branches like arms. They were visible only for a few moments, more shadows than detail. Far too tall to fit in the house, the three of them simply smashed a pair of second-story windows with their crowns of appendages and jammed their cargo through, then scuttled away from the house and faded from view, as if they'd never been there at all. Had they been aware of her watching them? 
One seemed to pause and turn her way, but nothing about them remotely suggested that they had faces, much less eyes. Surprisingly, few people had seen them, even though most had been carried by them. These, the general consensus went, were but a few of the thousand young left behind to enforce the pact. She grabbed her bag and hurried for the Henderson's house. She wondered how far they'd gotten and where the car was, if they'd ever see it again, or the possessions they'd deemed important enough to carry, if they would even care. In maintaining the status quo, vehicles didn't seem to matter. People were paramount. They'd locked their front door when they left this morning, but it overlooked the back, so she let herself into the house that way. It was as silent as it was dark, until she blindly slapped a light switch in the kitchen, then heard them overhead as they started to awaken. They got louder as she made her way up the stairs, the weeping, the sounds on the verge of screams, as if they hadn't yet processed what had happened. These were not cries of physical pain. She was intimately familiar with those. These were worse, in a way. Pain could be managed. Hopelessness and despair came from a deeper place than nerve endings. She found them lying huddled in the shards of their windows. Cuts, bruises, scrapes, that was the worst of it. She could treat those. The trauma might take a lot longer to get over. More likely, old mad Donald would be dead before they had a chance. As went the Hendersons, so went the rest of Tanner Falls. Few things were more contagious than panic, and few people were in a better position to gauge it than hospital staff. The accident rate spiked again, the way it did whenever fresh fears arose over Donald Beasley's mortality. And those prone to dulling their fears with drink did what drunks often do. Had Beasley and the others foreseen this in their selfishness? The suicide rate spiked too, or rather attempted suicides. It never worked. They were brought in by paramedics and frantic families, and occasionally they came in under their own ghastly power. People who should have been dead, bodies broken, veins opened, brains exposed. Yet somehow life had been refused exit. There was nothing worse to treat than screaming people who should have been in the morgue and knew it, who wanted to be there, and were denied it. Had Beasley and the rest meant for this to happen in trying to preserve the town they'd claimed to love? All along, townsfolk had continued to die of natural causes, but cheating was not allowed, which didn't keep the desperate from trying anyway. They learned the folly of it no better than those who tried to flee, but at least the runners weren't shattering their bodies in the process. In trying to kill themselves... They had instead been slowly killing her sense of compassion, which made it all the easier for Bethany to hate them for it. The adults, anyway. It wasn't in her, not yet, to hate today's casualty. Allison, the girl's name. She'd hung from her backyard noose all night, and by the time her father discovered her this morning... Her slim neck was stretched by inches. This soon it was impossible to say if she would ever hold her head upright again. She was fifteen years old. You did what you could. You made them comfortable. You tried not to contract their despair. This was no way to live for anyone. And, as she needed to do more and more once a crisis was over, Bethany retreated into the hospital hall to shake it out. Soon there followed the smell of cigarette smoke. She'd come to welcome the stink of it, for these little moments of decompression with Dr. Richard. There's no meaning to this anymore, 
said the man who, two weeks ago, vowed to crawl inside Beasley's chest before letting him die. For the first time in her life, she wished she smoked too, because if she did, that was exactly what she would be doing now. She pointed to the fuming stick between his fingers. Those things will kill you, you know. If only. He seemed to contemplate snuffing it out, then didn't. That's been the idea. But I don't think cancer likes me. The ones who die naturally, do you think they've escaped what's coming? She asked. Or did they just get scooped up earlier than the rest of us? He shrugged. A yeah, moot point for me. It was worth a try. The hallway windows overlooked a stretch of parking lot, and beyond that stood a neighborhood of grand old houses, and beyond that was the buildings of downtown, most prominently the Tanner Hotel, with that hateful sign they could never be rid of. It was the tallest thing around. They all lived under it, no matter where their homes were. You know... I've never believed in life at all costs. I've been called a heretic for it, just not by anybody whose good opinion of me mattered, Richard told her. I could never see the value of using extraordinary measures to squeeze day after day of life out of a patient, when the only thing we're accomplishing is prolonging suffering. Quality of life always seemed the better benchmark to me. Somehow I got away from that. As they stared out the window, from somewhere beyond view came the sound of another siren. Is this really quality of life? Matt, my husband, says we should go out to Route 15 and repaint the Welcome to Tanner Fall sign to read Death Row, she said. But of course, that would be change. Can't have that, Richard clucked disapproval. Don't most patients, when it's terminal, want to be the ones to choose when they die? I think they do. It's the last decision they can control. At least, it should be. Exactly, he said. I think I'll have a word with the mayor. She felt the weight of responsibility bearing down from above, from Daniel Beasley's room on the second floor. How nice to be rid of it. Are you getting at what I think you are? She asked. Probably. So it had come to this. After a moment's shock, she was surprisingly at peace with it. Then thought of her fellow nurse, Janet, sitting watch over the most hated man in the town's history. I'd start with his eyes. You need to offer people more than just a choice. She couldn't believe the words coming out of her. But it had come to this. You need to offer them participation. On the day of the special election, she took another turn as watch nurse, sitting at Donald Beasley's bedside, listening to the reassuring beep of the cardiac monitor, watching the rise and fall of his chest. Machines hummed and puffed. His face and arms were a topography of wrinkles and tubes. He was awake, even cognizant. He studiously avoided her, preferring instead to look straight ahead at the far wall, until after an hour of being ignored... Bethany scooted her chair close enough to lean on the bed rail and to smell the dry, musty odor of him, so he couldn't pretend her away any more. I get it, she told him. I really do. How scared you all must have been. That's the last word any of you would have used with each other or with yourselves, but that's exactly what you were. Scared. Grown men as scared as little boys when the bully shows up to take a toy truck away. The more she had to say, the more he creaked his head away from her, toward the window, and its view of the town that despised him. 
The whole world must have looked like it was changing all at once back then, and none of it into a place you wanted to go. Guys like my husband, they grew their hair out and started playing music you couldn't understand. Girls like me, they got birth control pills and started realizing there could be a life beyond the kitchen and the crib. We discovered drugs you shot and beer types never dreamed of. Now that she'd started, she couldn't turn it off. And black people, there was no keeping them to the back of the bus anymore, was there? It didn't matter how many of their leaders, bigots like you shot, or how many dogs or fire hoses you turned on them, they were going to keep coming no matter what. And that must have scared you most of all. Under his sheet, Beasley quivered with what she hoped was impotent rage. You armchair patriots. You had a war the country was turning against. And deep down, maybe you even suspected that the men who wanted to keep it going were lying to you whenever it fit their agenda. Only you were too dug in to admit it. She wanted tears from him. Maybe he was finally too dried out to weep. The world was leaving you behind. You cowards. Everything was slipping away from you. You were probably afraid someone like Charles Manson was going to show up any day if you didn't do something. I get it. So, if you couldn't stop the rest of the world from moving on, you wanted to stay hunkered down here in Maybury while it did. And I can't blame you for that. For being cowards. Because that's what cowards do. It's the nature of the beast to cringe. Under the sheet, his shallow breath had visibly quickened, and the cardiac monitor pulsed more rapidly. But how do you go from that to sacrificing everybody else's lives just to sustain your own little illusions a little longer? That's a whole different level of greed. A bunch of Goddamn sociopaths! The lot of you! If he had had a massive heart attack now, that would have been the most merciful thing for him. But he didn't. Good. How much could you all really have loved your town when you bargained it away to something that shouldn't even exist? Just to keep it the way it was until the last of your little group was dead. And then to hell with the rest of us, because we were only... What? Bargaining chips? At last, with effort, Beasley rolled his head back to face her. The goat, he whispered slowly, with a sound like dry reeds. The black goat. We never thought she would answer. Maybe Matt was right. Maybe this whole unconscionable situation began as a stupid lark. Sad little men still frolicking with whores and pretending to be bad boys, desperate to hold on to what was theirs a little longer. A little longer. Here's something else you never thought of. She shouldn't have been telling him, but it seemed important that he experience dread the same as the rest of them. Ever since people started to figure this out, the only thing that's kept you alive and whole is their fear of what will happen when you die. But even something like that runs its course. So you may not get off so easily as you thought. You know what's happening right now? The entire town is voting on what to do with you to see if they're willing to trade these last few days, weeks, whatever we have, whatever you have, for the satisfaction of making you suffer. And there, there it was, the terror in his eyes. It was what they all needed. I already voted before I came to work, she said. I voted in favor of it. To the surprise of few, the special ballot initiative passed. 3,658 in favor, 2,077 against, 
and another 5,100 or so who didn't bother turning out one way or another. Judgment Day, people were calling it, and preachers urged against it with all the effectiveness of street-corner lunatics. The town wanted blood now. There was no divine intervention coming, so they would take what they could get. It happened in the town square. Thousands filled the streets, while thousands more stayed home. On the courthouse lawn, they erected the platform used for speeches on Veterans Day, Memorial Day, a half-dozen different kind of parade days. The mayor was there to officiate, and police officers to keep order. And when Donald Beasley was brought in an ambulance, the crowd parted like water to let it through. His care team was down to just two, one physician, Dr. Richard, and one nurse, her colleague, Janet Swain. Even though they were overseeing his death, their job was still the same, to keep him alive as long as possible. And Janet got her wish. She drew first blood, taking Beasley's left eye. He'd been strapped to a gurney that was propped upright so the crowd could see it happen and a roaring cheer went up at the sight of the emptied socket. He may have been seventy-six years old, and looked at least a hundred, but he squealed like a feeble child. Out in the crowd a few rows away, Bethany averted her gaze to the ground, and squirmed her hand into Matt's, to hold tight for as long as they had remaining. Do you want to leave? he asked. She shook her head. If you vote for something like this, you should be prepared to see it through. Anyone who wished it got to take a turn, ushered into a line that filed up the steps on one side of the platform, descended on the other, and as far as what happened in the middle, that was up to them. Some were content to curse Beasley, others to spit on him. The rest were not so easily sated. They slapped him sliced him, pried off nails with pliers. They took his ears. They knocked out teeth. They ground cigarettes into his forehead and drizzled trenches into his skin with droppers full of acid. The cheering quit long before the line was through. People stayed. People left. People sobbed with a thousand different sorrows. Some were sick. Others wanted to go back in the line again, a few started laughing and never stopped. Bethany reminded herself that there was a time when Tanner Falls had been a great place to grow up. Scrape the veneer away, though, and this was what you got. The line kept advancing even after Beasley was pronounced dead. And why not? He may have cheated them out of tomorrow but they weren't about to let him cheat them out of one last chance to take it out on his corpse. They had an hour, give or take, before the sky pulsed with a single flash of light. Green, perhaps, or blue. Or maybe it was no color in the known spectrum. A fearsome wind kicked up, blowing west, pulled toward the source of the flash. They had felt this wind before. She clutched Matt's hand so hard it had to hurt him. Had to. All around them their neighbors shrieked and scattered by the hundreds, and though they were buffeted from all sides, she and Matt decided not to bother. When it running, ever worked. I had this dream last night, he told her, his voice starting to shake. It felt so real. As real as life. I dreamed I was given some sort of pipe to play for God in the chaos at the heart of the universe. Soon it became visible over distant trees and rooftops, dark and boiling, as mercurial in appearance as a storm cloud. So this was what they had summoned, called up, bargained with. This... The black goat of the woods with a thousand young. It was a deity from nightmares, still seeking its hold in the world. 
And in the east, the north, the south, wherever people had fled, they all soon found reason to shriek there as well. Tanner Falls resounded with it. A thousand young could round up a lot of stragglers. So, maybe we'll be okay, Matt said. Closer and closer still, it rent the air with a screech as if lightning could speak. It churned with mouths that opened and closed and reappeared elsewhere in the anarchy of its form. Why, she said, would you ever think that? Three blocks away, it detoured toward the hospital, passing by it, passing through it. This warehouse of failed suicides. And timeless moments later, the sky disgorged a furious rain of meat and blood. What if it could have had us all along? Matt said. But waited, anyway. It was coming. Why would it have done that? Coming for the town square. Maybe it was curious. Maybe it wanted to see what we would do. It was coming, as ground and pavement alike steamed beneath its pile driver hooves. And, and maybe now, here, today, Matt said, some of us finally became... worthy. Bethany shut her eyes as tightly as her hand held Matt's, as it bore down on them with the sound and fury of a cyclone. At last, at last, at long elusive last! It was time to leave home.